Statewide broadcasts of Your Legislators are made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org. We welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators, where we, have, we are delighted that you have joined us for an hour-long conversation about issues of public policy that are important to the people of the state of Minnesota. As is usually the case, we have a distinguished panel of guests that will help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul, but before we get to introducing that distinguished panel of guests, I want to remind you, the viewer, that this is your program, and this is your opportunity to call in your questions or to send them to us via the various electronic means that our crack technical staff will provide for you uh, at the bottom of your television screen. Take this opportunity to interact with your legislators. So without further ado, we move to the introduction of that distinguished panel. And we begin with a frequent guest on this program, been with us many times, Senator Carla Bigham. Senator Bigham, tell the viewers a little bit about yourself, the committees you serve on, your day job, other things that you think the viewers should know about you. The floor is yours. Thanks. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Justice Anderson. It's always a pleasure to be here and, and hello to my colleagues. Um, State Senator Carla Bigham, I represent Senate District 54, which is the southeast suburbs, um, Cottage Grove, Hastings, South St. Paul, St. Paul Park, Newport, Afton, and, and surrounding townships. Um, and my day job uh, is I'm trained as a paralegal, so that's what my degree is in. Um, spent some time working at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, uh, at many years actually, and then also um, have the honor to teach at Winona State University as an adjunct professor um, for Intro to American Politics and other courses. Um, have two dogs and uh, a husband and just, uh, you know, um, really focused on session and, and getting some good stuff done. I serve on the Judiciary Committee uh, and Civil Law Committee and local government, which all suit me. I'm a former city, uh, Cottage Grove City Council member and Washington County Commissioner. So I come with extensive local government experience as well. Well, very good. And thanks for joining us again. Also joining us, been with us before, I believe, Representative Dave Pinto from District 64B in St. Paul, I believe. Representative Pinto, tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Mr. Justice. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, so again, uh, as you said, Dave Pinto from the southwest part of St. Paul. So I represent the Highland Park, McAllister, Groveland area. You're, you're um, uh, viewers may be familiar with um, St. Kate's and McAllister and St. Thomas. Those are all in and around my district. Um, I work outside the legislature as a prosecutor at the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. So I specialize in gender violence cases, domestic assault, sexual exploitation, sex trafficking. It's kind of um, work that I've done a lot of, but really handle a wide variety of those of, of felonies and serious crimes. Um, and so I um, serve on the Public Safety Committee uh, in the Minnesota House, as you would expect. I do a lot of work in that area. But I'm actually the chair of the House Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee. Um, and so I've really have seen the uh, impact of, of us of not getting those early years off right and get to see that in a really bad way uh, in my day job and was determined to focus on those earliest years um, where you can make such a big difference. So that, that's a major part of my focus in the legislature. I'm um, just kind of in those two areas and, and others as well. And um, I have been on, uh, I think, once before, and I really enjoyed it and so glad to be back again uh, tonight. Thanks very much. We're uh, delighted, to, delighted to have you with us. Uh, and um, well, we won't, we won't talk too much about prosecution stuff. So, uh, we, we <laughs> here, so. whatever works. Whatever works is exactly right. Senator Mike Goggin is also joining us, been a frequent guest. Uh, Senator Goggin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yes, I'm State Senator Mike Goggin. I'm from uh, Red Wing, uh, represent Senate District 21. Um, I serve on the Agriculture Committee, Labor and Industry Committee, 
uh, higher ed and also uh, mining and forestry. Uh, and while I'm not uh, at the legislature, I work at the Prairie Island Nuclear Generating Plant as an electrical engineer and a project manager. Uh, married to my wife, Pam, for over 30 years now. I have two sons. I have my first uh, grandchild coming in April. Uh, my son and his, uh, my daughter-in-law. And so uh, we're, my wife and I are really excited to uh, become grandparents and go into the next phase of our life. So and I welcome and I thank you very much for having us on tonight. And then finally, uh, joining us for the first time, uh, also from the Red Wing area, District 21A, Representative Barb Haley. Representative Haley, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to our, uh, to our waiting audience. Uh, well, good evening and thanks for having me. Um, just an interesting fact, uh, Senator Goggin and I actually have known each other since we were kids and we figured out uh, recently, we remembered our first high school job was at the St. James Hotel. Uh, at a, a restaurant that they were um, launching. And so we have stories about uh, learning to be waiters and waitresses back in our high school days together. Uh, so I do represent a 21A Red Wing in Cannon Falls, Wabasha Lake City, what I'd love to call our beautiful South Shore of Minnesota. Um, out my, I'm doing this job full time. My previous career was in uh, business and telecommunications and uh, nonprofit management in education and healthcare. And as I, I tease my friends, when you become an empty nester and your kids uh, graduate and go off to college in the workforce, uh, you pick an encore career. So that's what I call my legislative career, uh, my encore career when the kids uh, have uh, left the home. Uh, but I bring, like I said, that extensive business experience to my role and, uh, and healthcare and education are really my passion areas. This session, I'm serving on uh, the Jobs Committee, the Commerce Committee, and the Legislative Process Reform Committee. And in my pre two previous terms, I was on um, Health and Human Services Finance. So still have a, a keen interest in the healthcare arena. And as I said, in the area of workforce and making sure that kids are prepared for their, their careers in post-secondary education. Those are kind of my passion areas. Well, very good. Very good. Now, in the early days of the session, we've been giving our guests an opportunity a minute or two to talk a little bit about issues that uh, are of priority to them in this legislative session, because, of course, the work of the legislature is just really beginning to get underway. We're beginning to see some hearings and some other things. And so um, some of that doesn't necessarily produce um, news in terms of topics of conversation. But I think some of the priorities that our legislators have does produce news. And so let's start with Representative Pinto, maybe you can talk a little bit in a, minute, in a minute or two about issues that are of concern to you in this session, matters that you'd like to see um, have some action. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, and I'll, uh, uh, the, what I want to talk about is, uh, is this early childhood work that I referenced before. Uh, and also I'll try to constrain myself because I can get real, real excited. Um, and I guess I'll just note that, um, that for all of my colleagues throughout the state, we have this huge crisis going on in uh, child care. The parents um, can't find care that is affordable. Um, that a, a rate that works for them to pay. Parents are paying huge proportions of their income. And I think many of us are aware of that. The people doing that work are being paid extremely little. So um, the lowest paid occupation of requiring a high school diploma, the worst lowest paid you could get is in fact in childcare. Um, and then on the other hand, we have a huge crisis in terms of opportunity gaps in our schools. I think folks may be aware of that, both um, racial gaps, but also in other groups as well. And um, the research says that that all starts in those earliest years as well. So you really have twin crises going on. And so um, a lot of my work is focused on addressing those twin crises and recognizing that this, the system that we have, such as it is, is really fundamentally broken. Um, just like you'd expect that if we didn't have, um, you know, significant public funding for for K-12 schools, if parents had to figure out how to get their kids educated and cared for, and we recognize now in, during this pandemic that schools, to a certain extent, are also about care for kids as well, having a place for kids to go and, uh, when parents are working, et cetera. Um, and so uh, uh, recognizing that if we didn't have that for older kids, boy, we'd be in a real world, world of hurt. And that's the situation we're in in those earliest years as well with a big payoff. So um, plenty more to talk about about that. I want to constrain myself to your minute or two, but I'll just just note that we really have a, a number of proposals um, to, to move forward on that. One thing I'm especially excited about is the idea of having a department of early childhood that would take programs that are currently in multiple agencies, um, at least three, and putting them in one place. So there's one person in state government who is accountable for doing what is really probably the most important thing that we do in society, which is to make sure that those earliest years get off right. Um, we don't have somebody with that accountability and authority right now, and there should be. 
And uh, so I'll be moving that forward, uh, that proposal forward um, uh, for a new department. So just a, that's just a couple of things. Thanks. Senator Goggin, your uh, priorities for this session. Uh, well, my priorities are uh, getting people back to work, um, getting them, you know, getting back to whatever kind of normalcy we can get to, uh, but also uh, keeping in mind that, uh, you know, with our agricultural industry uh, and our veterans, uh, we've got a lot of mental health issues uh, in those two areas. Um, so I, I really want to focus on those because uh, I have a a program that I, I start I got started back in 2017, the Helmets to Hard Hats uh, program for our existing veterans, our returning veterans, uh, to be able to, to start a new career in the in the skilled trades. Uh, and Representative Haley, she can talk extensively about uh, her work with the Youth Skills Training Program and and uh, and that uh, because we need to help those folks, uh, our veterans find a good career and great careers in the trades. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, for people to have a, a great future. And uh, it's been a great program. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we've had over 500 people uh, just in the state of Minnesota uh, go through that program and, and get great jobs in the, in the trades. And uh, in fact, this morning in the Veterans Committee, uh, I presented the bill uh, for this year uh, this budget year so that we can get uh, additional funding to uh, keep that program going. And, it, you know, when you look at it, it's about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per uh, person that goes through the program. Uh, but when you look at what it helps them uh, get back into civilian life, plus deal with any PTSD or stress that they might have from their deployments, uh, it's a very money very well spent and it, and it really helps those folks. Uh, and in the agricultural industry, you look at what our farmers have gone through. You know, last year we finally had the perfect storm of good weather. We got the crops in early. We got them on time. We got them out on time. We had high yields. Prices went up, um, but there's still a lot of stress in the farming industry. Uh, they, 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 those communities have had a really tough time the last seven, eight years. Uh, so we need to do all we can to make sure that we're uh, out there uh, ensuring that they have the resources they need to. Uh, stay focused on their job and, and stay safe on the farm. Uh, so like the farmer's advocates, uh, you know, that's an area that uh, I was just talking with uh, Commissioner Peterson earlier today about. Uh, and we need to make sure that those folks have someone they can call uh, when they're feeling stressed and they need and they need to talk to somebody. And our farm advocates have been a, a great resource for our farming community. So uh, those are pretty much my, my major uh, issue, the major items that I'm working on is uh, is an area there. So, Representative Healy, uh, priorities. Well, first of all, I think uh, our our major focus this uh, biennium we have to pass a balanced budget this year. Um, that's chiefly what we're there to do this year. I would say it's kind of been a slow start. I know in my committees I haven't uh, heard any budget bills yet, uh, so we've got to hunker down in order to get that work done on time. Um, and part of my focus around that is making sure that we do that responsibly. Certainly COVID has had such an extreme impact on our small business owners. And that's an area that I'm very concerned about. So we've got to balance this budget uh, without putting any additional tax burden on those business owners. And that would be a priority of mine. As I said before, I, I spend a lot of time really focusing on the intersection between our job seekers and our employers. And I think we've got to get very creative about that and realize that we're competing for workers, uh, not only in the states you know, neighboring us, but um, with the additional opportunity to work from home that people have, we're competing for workers from all over the country. And so again, our, our tax code is a really important factor in how we attract workers and making sure that we uh, do a really good job of just getting that message out to where we have job opportunities. Um, in rural Minnesota that I represent, for example, we have a fantastic manufacturing companies. And this is really true all over the state of Minnesota. And I think a lot of job seekers aren't aware of those uh, real high skill, um, high tech jobs that are available in phenomenal communities across our state. So I'm interested in, in you know, the work with Indeed and how we can do that better and faster and more efficiently. Um, I'm also looking at some creative programs uh, you know, similar to somewhat what our border states are doing. South Dakota has an interesting program 
um, whereby they will um, require, if you get a, a scholarship at a two-year school in South Dakota, um, they have raised enough money for those scholarships, but then also requiring that you work for two or three years after you come out with that degree or that uh, skilled training. Uh, so I think that's an, a unique program that we could look at emulating here in Minnesota. Um, as Senator Goggin said, a couple bills that I've carried in the past, um, I have carried the Youth Skills Training Program, which allows high school students to get workforce opportunities and, and um, an opportunity to uh, be on a manufacturing floor in an accounting department, in a marketing department, and really realize what the workforce is like when they're you know, 16 and 17 years old. Um, and then the next step of that, um, I carried the workforce development scholarships, which again provided grant money to our two-year schools in the areas where we need skills. Um, I'm always very focused on being targeted with state dollars and making sure you know, we target any of this grant money to the specific industries where we have job openings. So areas like ag agriculture and advanced manufacturing and IT and healthcare and construction. Um, so I'll be um, making a few changes to that legislation this year as well. Senator Bigham, priorities. Yeah, um, I, obviously the number one thing we're up there to do is the budget. As, as Representative Haley said, we'll be getting our um, final forecast, uh, February forecast, the end of February. And from there, we will um, start putting together the, the state budget. So that'll take up a lot of our time. But I think a top priority is getting this virus under control, getting vaccine, vaccines in people's arms um, and um, opening back up in a safe manner. Um, really focusing on our businesses, our small businesses, um, making sure that things are safe for our consumers and our workers. Um, and, and they are the lifelines of our communities, these small businesses. And, and um, we got to continue to be partners with them um, to help weather this storm. Um, I think we need to continue to address disparities that not only COVID shown, like really highlighted, but did truly exist before COVID that we just kind of didn't address. And and I'm talking about stuff in education. I'm talking about stuff in healthcare and in criminal justice. Um, you know, I think that that's very important um, to focus on and, and use those targeted dollars and, and tweak policies so that we can address those disparities. Um, I also think we need to, to continue to push um, green, clean energy jobs and policies and a transition into clean energy. Um, I know that Senator Goggin and I, um, in a bipartisan manner, have had bills um, that that last session that passed that did that for um, Prairie Island community. Um, I mean, it's it's a bipartisan uh, issue and it creates jobs and it's good for our environment and it's good for our economy. So we should do it. Um, a couple other things is we got to continue on broadband, 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 broadband. Um, if what COVID has done, it's shown that we are doing things virtually whether it's education, whether it's um, jobs, whether it's telemedicine. Um, we're going to telehealth now. Like that's gonna be the new word. Instead of telemedicine, it's telehealth. Um, so we gotta to continue to invest in that. And then two things that I've worked on um, pretty much since I've been up at the Senate is continuing to build our industrial hemp industry. Um, I wanna be the number one grower and producer of industrial hemp in the United States. Um, it's a good product, re, re, um, it's very durable and residual. And it's good for our farmers uh, and uh, there's a good commodity market for it. So we got to continue to do that. And then um, something that I think Minnesota needs to do and join the 27 other states and territories is legalized sports wagering. Um, I think that that is something um, that the market is demanding. Uh, it's already currently flagrantly done. So let's um, legalize it, put some parameters, consumer protections on that, and have a good consumer experience. I am sponsoring a bill with Republican Pat Garofalo, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to have a discussion this session uh, on that as well. So let's move to some questions that, are, that our viewers uh, have uh, provided to us. Um, and we have a viewer who wants to talk about uh, the uh, vaccine rollout and wondering whether or not the legislature uh, should be more involved in that. This viewers of the uh, opinion that uh, the priority should be the elderly and not uh, teachers or other groups. Um, let's talk briefly about that and, and what role the legislature should play in that. Let's start with you, Senator Goggins, and then we'll go to Representative Pinto. Well, yeah, uh, you know, we currently really don't have a role in it. This is what the governor's uh, been doing. 
Uh, this is what he's put together, the plan to roll it out. Uh, I personally wanted to be part of that, uh, uh, this, the support to help him uh, develop that plan. That's what I do as a, in my day job. Uh, I, I put plans together and I implement those plans. And I think I could have been a good resource for him. Uh, but uh, yeah, we do need to, we do need to prioritize the, the most vulnerable people first uh, and make sure that they get the, uh, the vaccines that, that are available. And, uh, you know, I just heard today that uh, the, uh, President Biden just uh, got 200 million more uh, vaccines uh, coming in, but we're probably not going to be able to get those out until uh, sometime this summer. Uh, so it's going to be a while, and it's unfortunate the rollout is going slowly. Um, but we do need to make sure that we're taking care of the, the most vulnerable people first, uh, first and foremost. And, um, you know, I, I I want to be a part of the part of the solution, and I would, you know, love to help the governor out with uh, whatever, whatever I can to help make this uh, rollout go go better. Representative Pinto. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the um, this is such a tough situation because there's just so little um, vaccine. I mean, we we've had. Um, I think it's pretty fair to say we had a real failure at the at the federal level. Um, I mean, at the very least, really no coordination among the different states. For a number of months, we were hearing, you know, sort of each state has to figure it out on its own. Um, and it is, I'm so glad, and I, I agree with Senator Goggin, that, that we are now hearing um, in these in sort of the early weeks of the Biden administration, um, a real move to, to really ramp up the um, production of vaccines. And so I think that that we're I mean, increasingly, I uh, remember the news that, you know, our, our, the number of doses is even doubling um, now, but um, but but it's starting, of course, from such a low base because we were in such a difficult situation. Um, I'll say that we're receiving regular briefings um, and uh, and you know regularly in touch um, with the administration. But it's a very challenging situation um, to be in as we're we're balancing out. I, I totally get what the caller is saying about wanting to make sure that el our elderly, who are so much at risk, on the other hand, we hear um, so much from parents and families about wanting to make sure that schools open. We certainly want to make sure that our teachers are safe as we're having the, the in-person learning going on. So that's a reason to prioritize them, the childcare workers, et cetera. So we're, as with pretty much everything else in this pandemic, we're in a very difficult situation, uh, which certainly was not helped by the um, kind of what was going on in the early months um, of addressing things. Representative Haley, your thoughts. Uh, I agree that it's a challenging situation, but I also think that we had some missteps. Um, we knew vaccines were coming. So there was time to plan. And in the past three weeks, we've had three different rollout plans from the administration. That's caused this sort of stop, start, stop, start. And it's confused people. And it's, uh, it hasn't been effective in getting the maximum amount of vaccines in people's arms that we could at one time. Um, what I've heard from my local providers is they know, they, they know the patients. Patients are used to calling their, their provider you know, they're used to getting their, vac their other vaccines and their shots, et cetera. Um, that's where we need to focus for the elderly. And I'm pleased that the governor did make a change this week. And so that should be ramping up. Um, and as far as our teachers, I, I talked to two superintendents today. They are glad that the governor has also changed and gotten public health more involved because the school systems are very connected to the public health system. You know, they're used to having flu shot clinics in school. Um, you know, for all the teachers. So that's a natural connection. Um, certainly we need uh, more vaccine distribution from the federal level, but we also need to be able to get it out the door quickly and efficiently for people once we have it here in Minnesota. And I hope and pray that we've turned the corner and that we have kind of locked into a plan that works for people now. Senator Bigham. Yeah, um, we did know uh, that vaccines were coming and it was far fewer than uh, anticipated. So um, really the federal rollout, not having a national plan really did impact that and it's coming home to roost. And, and I'm glad that, um, see how in Minnesota it goes to a hub that comes in, goes to a hub and then gets distributed. Well, now it's going straight to um, pharmacies and clinics, um, which is phenomenal as Representative Haley said. We, um, we really need them to be getting to their pharmacies, to their clinics where these doctors know their patients um, and can get them in. Um, I think teachers should have vaccines so we can open up uh, schools and get kids back in schools where they belong, where they succeed. And so I think um, when you look at um, the, there is no, no um, blueprint for this. Uh, there hasn't been since a year ago uh, when, when we knew this was coming. So the, 
the the issue happens to be is is now we're walking in with a new administration that um, thought things were better than they were, and so um, now they're making the adjustments, and and that's good. And and I'm hoping that between the announcement today and the changes that the uh, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan are making um, with the department and and really trying to get these vaccines in people's arms. Uh, is going to really make an impact in, in allowing us to continue to move forward and open up. So we have a question from a viewer um, in uh, Albany um, that uh, is actually, it, it actually touches on some legal issues, uh, but it has been the topic of discussion in the legislature over the last several sessions. We've in fact had questions from viewers previously on this. And this viewer is concerned about the uh, civil confiscation laws um, and the ability of law enforcement uh, and um, law enforcement and judicial forfeiture of, for example, uh, vehicles or other property and assets uh, in the event of criminal activity. And there have been reform bills that have been um, introduced in the legislature. Uh, in fact, one was passed a number of years ago, but nothing recently. And this viewer is concerned about where that issue is going. So. Uh, I don't think we'll spend a great deal of time on it, but Senator Bigham, let's start with you and uh, we'll go around the table, our virtual table. Sure, so I actually just signed on to a bipartisan bill with uh, Senator Johnson uh, on this issue. There is, um, I'm gonna say 95% to 96% agreement among state uh, holders. There, um, the, I don't think there'll ever be unanimous support on this issue, but but here's here's my thing, if we can, make an improvement to 95% of the situations that quite honestly, um, it's each department for themselves. And we have some unanimity, we have some standards, capping what can be um, confiscated, capping um, when a car can be returned and, and um, or setting, setting parameters of when a car can be returned and, and who can um, uh, go, when it can go back to, uh, to the owner. Um, without interfering in a criminal investigation, I think is key. Um, there are some horrific stories out there. Um, and if we don't pass anything, those don't stop. So if we pass a bill that has about 95, 96% uh, of agreement, we're going to see improvements and in, in, uh, due process and really um, uh, some improvements in this situation. So I do hope uh, that the House and the Senate and the governor can come together and pass this bill and sign it into law. Representative Pinto, your thoughts? Actually, yeah. I promise we were going to pick on your day job, and here we go. We're picking on your day job. <laughs> <laughs> well, and actually, it's, it's funny. I, I actually have no involvement with this in my day job I because I, I, I handled charging the case, you know, handled the criminal side, but then somebody else at this even kicks in. But I do have some familiarity with my work at the legislature. And actually, this is an issue. Um, and just to make sure that, that your viewers understand what we're talking about, that if there's... Um, you know, somebody's involved in, uh, in maybe possessing drugs, um, but they're driving a car, then perhaps their car could be, um, could be forfeited, uh, uh, you know, could be take, taken by the state um, in connection with the crime. And um, I think that viewers could imagine that, that there could be some real concerns with that, um, depending on the situation. And you have uh, the proceeds maybe funding a local law enforcement agency. Well, are they then, do they then have an incentive to police differently, to prosecute differently? And this is a, a rare issue that really does pull um, uh, folks together from wide ends of the political and ideological spectrum of concerns about civil liberties on the right and on the left, et cetera, which is a really nice aspect to it. And what's great is, as Senator Bigham said, um, it's something that although there's been a struggle the last couple of years, it seems like um, your viewer will be happy to know uh, that there is real movement. Um, and the proposal I think Senator Bigham signed on to is moving well through the House. Uh, it's got, uh, I think it's had strong bipartisan votes in the Judiciary and Public Safety Committees. And I'm really hopeful that we may um, be finally making progress. Um, I don't think that uh, that anybody, any stakeholder loves 100% of the bill, but they all just like tiny parts of it and they love <laughs> most of it. And that is often the sign of a good compromise. So I think we have some real um, real prospects for, for movement in this, uh, this session. Representative Haley, your thoughts? I don't serve on the Judiciary Committee and so I have not seen, um, or public safety. So I have not seen this proposal um, this <laughs> year. So I don't know um, the changes that have been made. Um, I think, you know, uh, Representative Pinto and Senator Bayham kind of described the, the tension in this. So how do you protect individual liberties and then also realize that when a crime has been committed and then property is seized as part of that investigation, um, 
you know, it's a, it's a, a balancing act there. And um, some of this, you know, forfeited material when they are able to sell it to law enforcement, um, that does fund, um, you know, additional things for their department. So um, the stakeholders are coming together. Um, this has been an issue for a number of years in the legislature. And like I said, I, I haven't read the proposals that have been are moving through right now. So I, I can't comment on those specifically, but um, these issues usually do take some time. So for the viewer that called in, <laughs> it takes a number of sessions to wrestle through and uh, maybe this session we will have a, a compromise on all sides. Senator Goggin, your, your thoughts, vehicle, uh, civil asset forfeiture. Well, I, uh, I, again, I have not seen the bill of myself or any of the changes that uh, have been made, but I'm gonna agree with all my previous uh, colleagues here. Uh, we have to come up with common sense, rational, realistic uh, solutions that are going to work for you know, Senator Bigham, you know, 95, 96% of the people. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we have the, the uh, parameters set up such that we're not having any abuses of the uh, forfeiture law or the confiscation law. Uh, because it has, in my book, it, in my perspective, it, it has to come back on what's the final determination in the court system. Uh, that should be more than anything, the overriding or overarching answer is how did they, what was the final outcome? And, and with that, there should be a, a parameter set up with which to uh, deal with property that was uh, confiscated at the time under uh, whether it was somebody poaching a deer or uh, someone doing some other type of crime. Well, very good. We have a viewer from Spicer, Minnesota that wants to ask a question about a topic that we touched on um, some members of our panel touched on briefly in their opening remarks dealing with clean energy issues. And this viewer is concerned about uh, why the state of Minnesota might mandate EPA standards from California instead of letting the marketplace determine the types of vehicles that are uh, bought and sold. Um, this viewer, I suspect, is uh, not in favor of the mandate. Um, this is actually, I think, a regulation, a rule that the governor has talked about adopting. There's a process that goes with that. It's um, it's a fairly lengthy process, but I think we can have a discussion about the issue itself and uh, what our panel thinks of it and uh, what, if anything, the legislature might do here. Let's start with you, um, uh, uh, Senator Goggin. I don't think we've given you an opportunity to bat lead off yet today, so we'll start with you and uh, go around our virtual table from there. Go ahead. Well, uh, my take on this is, is the way this is being handled is the legislature is not being part of the process. Uh, and he's just said, this is a very lengthy process that uh, really needs to get vetted. And we really need to, 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 to have the discussions, uh, put all the options out on the table. Uh, I'm in all of the above. I don't think we, we should have just one, one answer. Uh, we need to make sure that we're doing the right, uh, doing right for the people of the state of Minnesota. And we have people in the metro areas, we have people in the rural areas, we have our farmers, our, our truck drivers, uh, our mining and our logging industry. Uh, so we have very diverse needs for energy out there. And to, to do this type of mandate is going to really, uh, without having it go through the legislature and go through the legislative pot process and have the people's voices heard, uh, it, it opens itself up for uh disenfranchising one uh, group, uh, different groups of people versus others. And in the end, uh, you know, it, it may not be the right solution. And, and I personally don't want to have our um, EPA standards hitched to the way, uh, hitched to the vehicle of California, uh, where we can't uh, have any say in it here at the state of Minnesota. We're very smart people. We, we know what we need to do. And uh, we don't need to just say, we're going to do what California does. And, uh, you know, myself, I want to I want to see an all of the above solution, and uh, we need to make sure that we have a diverse mix of uh, uh, out there, so that, so that people can have choices. And by doing it this way, uh, it's severely limiting the choices of, of people out there. So, Representative Pinto, your thoughts? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I I agree about options and choices, and so I mean, I, I guess I'll note that um, that of the I think there's more than 40 electric vehicle models sold in the U.S. and fewer than half are even available in Minnesota um, auto dealers. Um, what this is about is this is setting a standard um, and allowing um, consumers then to be able to choose uh, customers to choose um, a vehicle that actually meets their needs. I think we're seeing all around Minnesota 
the impact of climate change. And we've noticed that um, lakes are freezing later and thawing earlier, um, that we're having um, significant change and we have got to take steps to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And the fact is that transportation and, and, and uh, automobiles um, pose a, a, a particularly uh, large pr portion of that, uh, of those greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is an existential threat. It's coming right on us. And the thing is, we can do something about it by giving people more options and choices in terms of the vehicles that they choose and be able to have vehicles that they drive that are more efficient, that will save them, save consumers money for gas um, and all kinds of good things. So to my mind, setting a standard that drives us towards um, a, a cleaner Minnesota um, and giving people the option to do that just only makes sense. So I think it's just a, a terrific program and uh, an approach. Resident Healy. Well, it probably won't surprise you that I would align more with Senator Goggin's view right. than Representative, my friend, Representative Dave Pinto. Um, first and foremost, this needs to go through the legislative process so that we can vet it and, and the, the voices of Minnesotans can be heard. Uh, I am very much opposed uh, to what the governor is trying to do on this and, and impose a standard through rulemaking that has not been vetted. Uh, so that's regardless of the, the policy, that procedural uh, process is wrong, in my opinion. Um, the, it, to, to adopt a California standard when we have a completely different <laughs> um, economy, we have completely different weather, uh, it is just, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, far, the farmers and the uh, manufacturers in my community that I represent have no interest in this standard and it, it doesn't meet our needs for the types of vehicles that we need to drive uh, and for the commerce that we need to conduct in my area. And just right off the face of it, the standard would increase the cost of automobiles by over a thousand dollars. But again, going back to first and foremost, the process is wrong. This needs to come through the legislature so we can discuss it and vet it. Senator Bigham, your thoughts? Um, well, climate change is real. Climate change is a top priority for a lot of Minnesotans. And the number one contributing factor of greenhouse gases is transportation. And so um, it's a problem that needs to be addressed. And for years, Washington um, well, for four years, <laughs> Washington hadn't acted on climate change and climate um, issues. Uh, most vehicles, most recent vehicles uh, meet the standards already. And um, all this simply does is set standards so that, um, you know, more electric vehicles will be in the market. And right now we have more demand than supply of those electric vehicles. Um, we also need to continue to invest in electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so that people can go, you know, all over Minnesota and charge and not worry about charge your vehicles and not worry about um, uh, any any issues. Um, and, you know, it's it's no one's going to be forced to give up a car. There's going to be no emissions tests uh, like there were back in the way back in the day. Um, and there has been actually a lot of input and the um, hearing, I think, for the um, the administrative judge hearing is in next week, I think, or the week after, and there's public input. Uh, and you can actually go to the MPCA's website and submit your public comment. And they did have um, public hearings throughout the, the state. So um, I continue uh, to encourage people to submit your comments um, so that they are part of the, the um, record, uh, whether you're an uh, automobile dealer uh, or somebody that's um, really uh, wanting to make sure we have a clean environment for our future, um, please go to the MPCA website. You see the link right there where you can submit your public comment to the administrative judge. So for our viewers who are interested in this topic and wish to pursue it further, of course, in addition to this resources and uh, uh, the uh, information that Senator Bigham provided, I can also advise that the business columnist for the Star Tribune had a column in the paper this morning uh, that discusses, I, I think, uh, you know, both sides of the issue uh, and lays out some of the uh, arguments for and against, and that might be a place to start if you're interested in more information. So uh, let's move on to our next question. And this is a, a question that we've had on previous programs. It remains an area of concern for Minnesotans. And this is uh, a question from a viewer who is concerned about uh, the um, body grip issue and um, protecting dogs from body grip traps. Uh, and the question is, is there going to be any action on this uh, issue uh, in this legislative session? Uh, Representative Haley, uh, well, what, what are your thoughts about this, if any? 
you know, I've got to uh, push that out want, to my colleagues. You want to phone, a, phone have, a friend? You I want need to phone, to phone a, friend? a friend. I have no familiarity. And I always say that in the legislature. If I don't know, I'll tell you. I don't know about this one. Up, up, I think she called you. Yeah, well, uh, and I don't know that we'll agree with, about on, on this because I, I, I don't know where she stands on this. But, um, you know, uh, trapping is extremely dangerous when you don't have written permission to be on people's land. It's their private land. And people should have to have written notice that you are going to lay a trap on that land so you can protect your dog. Um, and, and it's tragic. Um, I, I sponsor legislation with um, Senator Housley on this. Um, and, and it's really a land rights issue. That's how I see it, is nobody should be able to walk onto your land. I mean, um, I have a half, you know, a little less than a half acre, um, but you have huge acres, you can't track it all. And if you wanna allow trapping, um, you need to have written permission. And I think that, that um, they should be outlawed and we should also have anybody that's going to do any sort of um, trapping uh, has to have a written permission so your dog doesn't get caught up in it. Representative Pinto, your thoughts? Yeah, um, so it's interesting. That, so I don't, I don't work in this area um, in any committees that I'm in, but it, but it has seemed to have come up regularly. I certainly have constituents who are very interested. And I think that there's both the issue that Senator Bigham um, identified, which I agree really view as a, as a property rights issue to say that um, I think right now the, the law says that you can actually go on to somebody's property and, and, and set traps and to say that, that, um, that that's um, just not appropriate. It should be that, that uh, um, you should have to have expressed permission. But the issue of, of then of the, um, the way in which the traps actually work um, can be extremely dangerous um, to dogs. Uh, and so the idea is simply that we should have, the trap should be designed in a way so that they, um, that they will be safer and could be placed in such a way to be safer um, for dogs where they can then um, catch the, the animal that is intended. Um, but uh, but we really, um, there's just some uh, horrific incidents as were described um, for dogs. This is something that we've been trying to advance. I think that there's a, that there's a fair amount of support in the DFL house, there has been, um, but, um, but I, I believe that, uh, that it's been um, stop up in the Senate, um, Republican Senate, I believe anyway. Um, but uh, uh, so I, I think it's in terms of your viewers question, I think it may be very difficult um, to pass, but Senator Gaga may have um, some more information on it. So let's go to Senator Goggin. Body grip traps and, and uh, trapping issues, dogs, matters of this sort. What, 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 uh... Well, I uh, I have not heard of any legislation coming up this session in regards to that. Uh, we did have uh, have that a couple of years ago. We had uh, conversations and discussions about that, uh, but it does. It goes back to the property rights issue. It goes back to uh, you know how do you make that work, and that. From what I recall from a couple of years ago, that was the uh, uh, the major issue was the property rights portion of it, and you know, and the traps. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, if I had dogs, I wouldn't want my dogs uh, getting caught up in those traps either. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a it's not a, not a pleasant thing to see. So, I mean, as people can imagine, Justice Anderson, you want to know where those traps are so you can steer your dog away from them. And that's why you need to have the express written consent for for having the traps if you're going to trap so that um, I mean, I, I don't I don't like it at all. But um, if you are, you got to have it written so that people on the who own the property know where it is so that they can steer people away from it and warn them. One of the great things about this program is our viewers are uh, involved with and concerned about some very specific issues that don't always get headlines, uh, at least headlines on the front page of the morning newspaper. And this next topic is one we've had on a couple of occasions. Uh, and it's pretty interesting because it's also generated some national conversation and it concerns the right to repair. And this viewer is concerned about whether or not the legislature is going to pass a bill or, or deal with this topic of right to repair. And I'm gonna pick on you, Representative Pinto. Uh, maybe you could talk to our viewers a little bit about that, what that means and what, if any, action do you think the legislature might start on that? Thank you. Um, I, uh, so this is another issue that I have not encountered in committee, and I don't know that I would. And yet I have quite a few constituents who are interested. And I feel like ever since I've been in the legislature, it's been raised as, as an issue. And um, it certainly makes a lot of sense to me. So the idea is to say that if you purchase an electronic product, um, you should have the right to, um, to access that product uh, and, and to... Um, uh, to be able to repair it, have access to repair manuals, et cetera, um, rather than being something where you'd have to take it to an authorized repair service, not be able to get access to the manuals that you'd kind of be able to to, um, to do that. That makes a lot of sense to me from a 
certainly a consumer rights issue, but also from an environmental issue. We want to have people be able to repair products and not simply not throw them away or have it be too expensive um, to do that. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, again, that's something uh, that has, um, I think, has I've seen move a bit from what I've, I've observed, again, not in committees that I've been in, but just from afar, um, but then has kind of um, has stalled out. Um, I would certainly hope that that would, um, would move forward. I think it makes a lot of sense, um, but, uh, uh, but I think has often gotten, uh, gotten kind of blocked um, by, because of course, and let me just point out um, that the large electronics manufacturers have, have tended to be very resistant to this because um, they want to have sort of end-to-end -end control. Um, perhaps there's an incentive to want to have you buy the new, new version of something rather than repair the older version of what you have. Um, and so there's been some resistance at that, um, at that large company level. Representative Haley, your thoughts? Uh, on a very basic level, uh, going back to my interest in uh, skills and workforce and having kids prepared for that, let people tinker if they want to tinker. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> right that, that's what we don't have enough of um freedom <laughs> we don't have enough of the farm kids anymore who grew up you know fixing and repairing everything and the kids that want to have a you know the, the the car shop in the garage uh so on that just basic level um i, I support people's right to want to do that and we, we need more of that skill set in this world but i have not um, reviewed the legislation, so I can't speak to that um, specifically. And uh, it hasn't come up so far in the, the five weeks of sessions thus far. Senator Goggin. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I work at a, a power plant, and you know, back in the in the day, a lot of the people that came to work at the plant were farmers and people that worked with their hands, and they were great employees to have because they could figure things out. Uh, you know, and I, the the two things I've heard most uh, manufacturers and that talk about is uh, trade secrets and proprietary uh, equipment and that. And so they're just they're they're saying they're protecting their uh, their research and development and what they put together. Uh, so that seems to be like the biggest issue right there and the biggest hang up. Uh, but I am all for one that wants to you know take a radio apart or whatever it might be and and uh, you know work on fixing it. I done some of that in my in my life as well where I've uh, known that there's an internal part to the black box that needs to be replaced and you open up the black box you find out which part it is you go out and you find it and you put it in um, but that's that's where you run into it I mean uh, in, in my work I have proprietary uh, equipment that we can only get to a certain point with it before we have to get the original equipment manufacturer involved because they have all the uh, internal information inside the black box for lack of a better. So, so uh, for any of our millennials who are watching, the uh, radio is a thing. It used to sit on the table. <laughs> it had knobs. Oh, never mind. Senator Bigham, uh, right to repair. Um, I was going to say what um, Senator Goggin said, which to me, the um, one thing that kept coming up in opposition was the right to proprietary information. And so um, I think that's what's stalled it through um, many of the years. I actually haven't heard or seen about it in the five weeks that we've been there. But I also think that uh, Representative Haley is going to win Twitter today with Tinker if you want to <laughs> Tinker. That's going to that's gonna win Twitter today, man, I tell you. <laughs> Well, so that uh, introduces a topic that we'll go, we'll turn right to Senator, to, uh, to uh, Representative Haley to talk about. And that if we have a viewer who's concerned about higher education, where those budgets might be going and what the priorities might be in higher education. And the viewer's wondering what the kind of flash points and conflict points might be uh, in the higher education area. Let's start with you, Representative Haley, on that question. Higher education budgets, priorities in this next two year biennium. Well, certainly our higher education institutions have been impacted by COVID, um, just like every other family and every other uh, business. Uh, so I'm sure those budgets are, are certainly a concern for those institutions. Um, we, we have an obligation as a state to support our you know, state land grant universities. And I always say to, to my uh, you know, colleagues that, that work in that area, the success of our two-year schools and our four-year schools um, predicts a lot of our success as a state. We need kids to have uh, post-secondary credentials, uh, trade skills, you know, work experience, and, and degrees, and we need that full spectrum covered. 
so we need those schools to be uh, prepared to, to um, train our kids and teach our kids for the future. Um, budgets are gonna be a challenge uh, for us because we have a deficit and we've got to address that deficit. Now we'll have an additional forecast coming out here you know, at the end of the month. But right now um, it's a deficit and that means everybody's not gonna get what they want. Those are the tough decisions that uh, we were hired to make. And um, at, at, you know, at this point there's, there's gonna be some budget cuts in, in some part of the state budget to balance it. Um, but um, I, I am a big proponent of, of our schools, so that wouldn't be an area that I would look at cutting. Representative Pinto, your thoughts? Heritage. Yeah, um, yeah. The um, uh, I guess I tend to think in terms of the full educational spectrum I referenced before. Um, you know, our realization that the your very earliest years really are part of development and learning. I mean, right? You know, the science says right zero to three, et cetera, and then we focused a lot on K twelve, and then. And then we know that um, that success in the 21st century economy requires a strong higher education, um, and it's so critical that we that we support that. Um, and I think we it's important also for folks to to recognize that the share of state support for these um, just wonderful higher institutions, institution of higher ed, um, has really dropped a lot. So you know, in the 70s, um, the state uh, might have been providing three quarters of the support, um, and now it's down to I think more like a quarter or a third. Um, and this is why our students are then graduating with such such huge amounts of debt. So I agree with Representative Haley. Um, we have difficult choices to make. Um, and I think it's important to recognize um, sort of the short-term versus long-term thing, that as we make cuts in each of these areas, um, if, we, if we do that, um, and maybe that in fact, we're sort of ending up starving ourselves later on as we're having students um, not have uh, the success um, that, uh, that when they have that success, it ends up being for the benefit of all of us. And that's true in higher ed. And it's certainly true in the younger ages as well in K-12 and even those earliest years that I tend to focus on. So um, we really need to invest in our students so that they can then invest in and, and pay off for all of us as well. Senator Goggin, higher education budgets, priorities. Uh, well, actually we're just starting to hear uh, from uh, the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota State Colleges uh, what their uh, requests are. and as we sit uh, through the committee and hear their proposals in that, uh, and also you know, with the University of Minnesota, we're working on uh, uh, filling four positions on the Board of Regents. And uh, I told them, I said, you know, we really have to figure out what the true needs are versus what the wants are. Uh, and that's always a very difficult uh, thin line to, to, to walk. Uh, but at the, end of the, at the end, we have to make sure that we have properly funded our higher education so that the students that come out with the degree and graduate have, can walk away saying, I have the highest, I got the highest value I could for my education dollars. Uh, and and, it, and it's, it's a value to them and, it, and it's something that they're going to be able to carry forward uh, through the rest of their, their, their career and their life. Uh, so we have to uh, make sure that what we're doing is uh, keeping the, the student in uh, in focus the whole time and making sure that they get the best value that they can uh, during their education at the higher higher education universities. Senator Bingham? Well, I think um, if we are going to turn this corner with COVID, we have to invest in our future workforce, our existing workforce for retraining. And we're, that's going to cost money. That's going to cost resources. So we have to prioritize that. We need people to be innovative and, and have that entrepreneur spirit, but be well-trained and, and have really good skills to um, flood the workforce so that people um, are, are really um, available to, to go back to work and, and really help us turn the corner and rebuild um, the economy uh, that works for everybody. And Minnesota is traditionally actually a very good place. We have how many Fortune 500 companies um, that are headquartered here because of our workforce. And so we need to keep that investment. We need to keep doing that. Um, and I, I think that when, when you look at w what the new normal will be, um, it's gonna be a lot in IT and programming, and it's gonna be a lot in our trades. And, and it's going to be a lot in, in how we're going to, um, you know, re, reopen in a safe manner, but in, in a manner that's going to work for everybody. And so there's a lot to do and there's a lot of 
of need there that is going to be for, for retraining and for education. And so um, we have to, we have to really figure out um, the priorities there and, and make sure that we don't take our foot off the pedal um, because I mean, we really need to invest in that workforce and in the higher education experience of our Minnesotans. We only have about a minute left, but very quickly, a uh, viewer wants to know about the regent process. Uh, who wants to take a, about a 30 I think seconds? we do too. I think we want to know about it. <laughs> it's a joint committee that's 201 people. I don't think there's a Zoom account big enough, Justice Anderson. <laughs> uh, uh, I agree with Senator Bingham. <laughs> Senator, Senator uh, Goggin, just give us about a 15, 20 second uh, pricey on what that looks like. It's a 201 member body. What, how's that, what does that mean? Well, right now uh, we're going through interviews with the, uh, with the candidates that came out of the uh, region's uh, uh, candidate committee. Uh, and so we're interviewing them right now. And then uh, I think it's the 13th, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's on the 13th of the month uh, uh, of March. Is that correct, Senator Bigham? I think so. That's yeah. I think well, so. So that's uh, and and we've run out of time. So we'll have to wait till the thirteenth of March to find <laughs> out what happens. I I want to thank our uh, panel again this evening for uh, a wonderful program. I want to thank you, the viewers, for your participation. This program is all about you. It's not about the panel. It's not about the moderator. I want to invite you to be back next week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature goes home. Thank you and good evening. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org.